Twice a week, Van Lathan and Rachel Lindsay dissect the biggest topics in Black culture, politics, and sports on their show, Higher Learning. They discuss the most important and timely conversations while also frequently inviting guests on the podcast and occasionally debating each other. Check out Higher Learning on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, fulfilling a lifelong goal to see Jamie Foxx's Electro back on the screen, it's Andy Greenwald! Happy birthday to you. Oh yeah. Happy What's up, birthday, man? buddy. Kick in the door, wave in the 4-4. It's me. <laughs> it's the most wonderful day of the year. Are you a it's birthday Chris Ryan's guy? Birthday. No, but no. I love tormenting other people who aren't. Yeah, I can guys. tell. You a lot, lot of texts from you. Well, I just feel that people I love it. I mean, be, I love you uh, texting me. Yeah. For what it's worth, listeners, I don't think I flooded the zone. What I did was, I, I, I feel, I don't know. I don't, you know, maybe there are a lot of questions here. I wake up very early mm. and I don't know if everyone else does. And I, I don't, don't know if everyone yeah. else puts their phones on do not disturb. So I didn't want to hit you too early, but I also wanted to be the first. So I timed it. So sort of like, I think 645, I sent you a JPEG of Jeremy Renner giving someone flowers. That's right. Special delivery from the mayor of Kingstown, which we will be discussing on today's episode. Which was episode my real birthday present for you. Of the Watch uh, podcast. I asked Andy to watch at least one of the two episodes of Mayor Kingstown, uh, which are available on the Paramount Plus uh, app. And Service. yeah, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about Shrink Next Door. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to chat about the Party Down reunion, but Greenwald, we have to start with the biggest pop culture story of the week. And that is um, Adele's 30. <laughs> Did you watch any of that special? I'm not crying. You're crying. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't. No. Are Did you, you an Adele person? No. Luckily, there's a podcast for that. We have uh, every single album launching. Kaya worked on that. You know, Ka That's Kaya, great. are you doing the Adele ones too? I sure am. See, Tune this is in watch Saturday, extended universe. Saturday, <laughs> afternoon ish for thirty instant reactions. Thank you so much for letting me plug. Incredible. <laughs> I, I have to say, there should be a term for culture that one is neither. Maybe it's like Goldilocks culture, mm. where it's like it's not something I love too much. I'm not too hot for it. I'm not too cold for it. It's fine. Like, oh, I, so that's what, you across the board with Adele, huh? What I mean is, I think she's, what a talent. Come on. She has yeah. an incredible set of pipes. That Skyfall song, maybe the best Bond anthem ever. Uh huh. I truly feel that. <laughs> Rolling in the Deep goes hard. But what I have the most, pipes? I have the most medium, medium opinions. Okay. I don't listen to her songs. Yeah. I, I have nothing but love and respect for those who do. And I'm glad there's a podcast for it. But Chris, where's the room for us mediums? You know what I mean? That's right. That's right. What, I, you know, what, what a I, compelling I think, podcast that would be. I think I'm a medium Spider-Man guy. Honestly. Okay. Yeah. Oh, like nice. I think First that of all, I, you are a hot segue guy. Thanks, man. I just like I I need to make sure that the mechanism still works. You know, yeah, even at this good. at this late age. Um. So this Spider-Man trailer dropped. It's the second one. I think that it will, by all accounts, be the biggest movie of the year. Perhaps the biggest movie since Endgame in terms of box office, in terms of anticipation. 
Andy, you and I have like I think a, a healthy relationship to this stuff. You know, mm. like I think that we are we are participants in the in the superhero industrial complex, but we're not necessarily like you know it. We don't live we're and die by it, right? No. You know, we have we're, 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 we have bigger fish to fry, like the modern in- <laughs> incarceration business. <laughs> who, who are the who is the, the prison rock? industrial complex uh, calls to us? No, but I like, like I uh, mm-hmm. I watched this trailer with a lot of interest because. This week, I feel like there's been an interesting like upswing in talk about the way these kinds of movies get made. So I thought I would just jump in there and we can get into like what's in the trailer and what's not in the trailer and how excited you are to see Alfred Molina cook again. But so there is a GQ uh, UK profile of Tom Holland, which okay. uh, is your usual like it's all happening for him. And yet he's uncomfortable with it because he's 25 and he's been playing Spider-Man for most of his quarter of his life. Uh, and can't do anything anymore except play golf and sit at home. Um, well, I mean, has he has he noticed the rest of the world? You know, but in the article, he talks yeah. about how this movie was supposed to come after Doctor Strange. It is now coming before Doctor Strange, which require, oh. required uh, hefty rewrites, I think, of both. And now Doctor oh, Strange why, hmm. is going in for six weeks of reshoots. Uh, which is which basically... Announced. Another movie yeah, of reshoots. It's a lot of reshoots. <laughs> and then also that there was it, you know, that this this Spider-Man film is essentially being written while it was being shot, or at least according to Tom Holland. And that in the climactic scene, to Tom Holland was essentially like, hold up, hold up, like this doesn't make any sense, and had a big role in rewriting um this climactic, I assume, battle. And we'll see who's in it. Obviously, there have been rumors right. that Tommy McGuire and Andrew Garfield are going to reprise their roles as previous Peter Parker's PPPs. We'll refer to them as uh, going forward. Well, I, I, also ahead. the big rumor is uh, your boy, fresh from Taboo Island, Tom Hardy's going to swing in as Venom, right? Well, like this they, is the thing. They, so this Spider-Man movie may in fact be mm-hmm. not only a Marvel Phase 4 movie, not only a Spider-Verse movie with like Craven the Hunter and Morbius and Venom, but also like the launching pad for the Sinister Six, which has been yes getting talked about, which okay. is like the Spider-Man villains that form like a crime fighting unit. Like what? Are, what are those guys? Okay, well let's 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 run it back for a second. So this is that's interesting to me. I did not know the scheduling thing is what triggered the reshoots. So my guess then, just from the you know back of the envelope math, which yeah. I love to do in these things, is that a lot of this seems to come from the story here seems to be right that. After the events of the previous Spider-Man movie, where Peter Parker is outed as Spider-Man. And, and yeah. He would then, in the Doctor Strange movie, go to Doctor Strange and be like, can you undo this, please? Yes. Doctor Strange would cast a spell that would work, but maybe open up some multiverse stuff that would lead to his own adventures. And then the Spider-Man movie would come out because the the ripple effect of this reality-bending spell has caused major problems within the IP libraries of a number of studios. The way you say it cetera, makes it sound so easy. <laughs> but, Kevin, but then Sony, because Sony controls the Spider-Man movies, even though this is, you know, has Marvel's fingerprints all over it, was like, no, we need, we have the biggest movie of the year, potentially. Your schedule snafus don't involve us. We're still releasing this movie right. in December, right. which caused an enormous ripple effect uh, in its own kind of multiversal way where all the different competing... Okay, so that's probably what happened. And and right. that's also probably why the trailer that dropped this week really seemed... I almost thought I missed a movie because they are like... that. Doctor Strange is like, that spell we cast, it's not working. I'm like, yeah. oh, oh, did you guys cast a spell? Yeah, okay. there's a tremendous amount of the setup for the movie in the trailer. And if not just the setup, like I think there's a lot of the movie in the trailer. There's obviously some shoes to drop and and... I think it's worth noting that um, Spider-Man is one of the most sort of broadly appealing characters in all of superheroes, but they are, I think, generally speaking, when you get to the third film in a trilogy, mm-hmm. you're you're entering um, the sort of somewhat more darker areas. Not only are the characters older, the characters have been through a lot, but to make the fa- final film feel like it has a lot of stakes, something has to happen. You know what I mean? Even Jedi, which is... I guess in some ways, like lighter than Empire, still has significant, uh, yeah, because of the Ewoks, and it still has a significant character death. So I don't know. I think that, like, when you watch this trailer, that's a really good point. Like, you're, you, you, that setup that the whole 
the whole like I cast this spell. It's like when did I did I miss that part well, of the movie? The interesting thing to me here is well, there are a couple interesting things before we even talk about the trailer and what we think about the movie. So just to rewind, I think most people who listen to our podcast know this, but when Marvel became the global was on the path to becoming the global power that it that it is. Um, or actually, let's start before that. Let's rewind. Turn of the century, no one was making superhero movies. No one seemed to be able to figure out how to do it except for an occasional Batman. Batman. And uh, Marvel, at this point, was not its own studio. It was not owned by Disney. And so they had farmed out whole quadrants, continents of uh-huh. their, their globe to different studios. And you know, so Fox had the X-Men and Sony had Spider-Man. And then Sony had success with Spider-Man. And then... Kevin Feige was like, maybe we can do this with the characters people don't know. And okay, so here we are. Mm -hmm. Some of the people, so like Fox also had Daredevil and Fantastic Four. And after years of trying to develop stuff was just like, we give up. We give them back to you, Mm -hmm. which was exactly what Disney and Marvel wanted to happen. And now those are all, those are all cooking on various burners. They got the X-Men back by buying Fox. (laughs) Sony it's kind of wild. Sony is so was really like l- on the bleeding edge here. Yeah. Sony was lethal weapon. You know what I mean? Sony was the last act of an 80s action movie where they're like this plan is so crazy it just might work. And they were like we are never ever giving this back to you. Yeah. You can pry it out of our cold dead morbius hands because now this is valuable. And so they worked out a truly insane like Gaza strip level profit sharing creative sharing thing with this iteration of Spider-Man, which is why Tom Holland is an end game, et cetera, et cetera. But they've taken these insane swings where they're like, yeah, we'll make a Venom movie and then a mm-hmm. Carnage movie and a Morbius movie. And we're just going to, and then, and then they struck, you know, beyond gold platinum with the Spider-Verse stuff. The wild risk taking they took kind of caused an infra, uh, like an incursion into the Marvel universe. It's in its a way that own mirrors this kind movie. of like multiversal event. It is. And it, yeah. it, in many ways, inspired i think or at least gave marvel the confidence to do this next phase of storytelling that they're doing like the 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 virus went into the main body when they did the tom holland movies and so now we're in this crazy place where literally anything seems to be possible that said there's always something a little disappointing and maybe this is the comic book fan in me or just the speculative industry person in me but the year of advanced build-up to this spider-man movie was a lot more fun than this trailer, which doesn't mean the movie's going to be bad. But all the sort of fun casting announcements and the what ifs and the and just the thinking about all these grown actors doing the Spider-Man meme, like that's fun stuff. And as someone who has loved movies, loved comic books for a long time, all this is verboten. Like you would never let the peanut butter touch the chocolate sure. like this. You know what I mean? Yeah. You just cannot do it. And yet it was all happening. And then we get the trailer and it's kind of a backdoor pilot for a Sinister Six project, right? Like that that's what else could it be? It's not gonna be Inception. It's not gonna be some weird David Lynch thing where Tom Holland confronts, you know, David David Lynch's Dune Fear Mind Killer. What I mean, it's not gonna be weird. <laughs> He's insi- I don't know vi- if it's gonna be weird, but he is insisting, Holland is insisting it's dark. But who wants it to be dark? It's Spider Man. So that's what it, I'm asking. You're the guardian of the galaxy here, man. Like I don't what like I just the, 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 the funny the, thing to me is that Spider Man. They keep making like two or three of these Spider Man movies with different stars, and it mm-hmm. just seems like first of all the amount of attention that these guys get eventually mm-hmm. breaks them. It happened somewhat. It certainly happened to Andrew Garfield. I don't. Tobey Maguire seems pretty poker faced about everything, including poker. <laughs> but Tom Holland, who is honestly like got like a higher approval rating than anybody in the world. Is essentially like, I need to like, I they need to make a Miles Morales movie, man. Like, I need to take a break. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're trying to dial this dude up for like a hundred Spider-Man appearances because they've got, if they do Sinister Six and they have all these Spider-Verse yeah. movies and they still want him coming back for Phase Four, like that guy's not going to be able to grind out like Cherry anymore. He's going to be wearing that fucking suit for the rest of his life. Well, I, I mean. I think he should do whatever he wants to do and deserves a wide and varied career. But the movie going public thus far has not been super welcoming to non Spider-Man Tom Holland movies. Cherry sure. And what was that Daisy Ridley, uh, Doug Lyman mega bomb that was released exclusively? Well, Uncharted is summer. the one that he's doing soon, right? I can't remember what that last one was called. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Dude, there's just a funny part in the, this article where he's talking about um, he was in 
the current war. He did like he had like a smaller part in the current war with Benedict Cumberbatch. And in while they were shooting, uh, I don't know if it was this one or there was Doctor Strange, like Cumberbatch and him were basically crisscrossing the Atlantic doing like their movies, and that like on the do- one I, I think on Endgame or something like. Cumberbatch was just basically like a body double for most of it for the week. And then he would fly in and do his close-ups and then Holland would go to London and do two days on like the, the scheduling stuff is so wild. It's so bizarre. And in modern movie stardom, I mean, you know, tiny violins, but it really must be strange and confusing. I, I think that it's interesting the way though, that just culturally and institutionally and financially, things that used to seem like liabilities now seem like strengths. And, and by that, I mean, when comic books just got so baroque that there were 19 Spider-Men and Spider-Women and Spider-Pigs, like th- the old days, they'd be like, well, we can't adapt this because what is this? This is just, this is just you know, nerd spaghetti. Like, I don't know what to do with all these strands. Mm-hmm. Now it actually seems like a way to extend people's careers because we're fine with multiple Spider-Men. We get it. It's fine. When's the next Tom Holland one? I'm looking forward to that, but I'll still see some minor league baseball, you know, when in the off season or when I'm in Wilmington, Delaware, whatever. I think that the dark thing bothers me slash bugs me a little bit only because this is a broken record. Spider-Man isn't dark to me. It's like Spider-Man right. is your friendly neighborhood wall crawler. And it's, you know, small bore problems that feel like they have the same stakes as global problems. And the incursion of Iron Man and like Stark tech into the Spider-Man world in these movies made no sense to me, other than the fact that they were not fully confident that they could sell Tom Holland as Spider-Man. And so they needed to put the biggest star into it. And now Doctor Strange is playing that role and heavy, dark stakes. Okay. That's fine, but it, I, that has never really worked for me. I'll say it still has to be a movie, and it still is expected to be a movie product that delivers on a half a billion dollar return, yeah. which is why it's not about his problems doing calculus homework anymore. And it does give me hope, small pivot, since we didn't do a podcast last week on Disney Day, that the very brief few <laughs> seconds we saw of the Ms. Marvel show uh-huh. does have that vibe. Good. You know, that that is probably better suited to TV anyway, and that that made me feel positively about it. Okay, so back to this wild movie that, you know, really does, with all the things you're saying and all the context you're giving it, it really does feel, le- it doesn't really feel like a movie anymore. It just feels like this colossal cultural happening that upon which rests the hopes and dreams of generations of fans, generations of actors, and you know, the share prices of not one, but two of the major media companies. Which we have considered bulletproof up until this point. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There was just like, things change, but, you know, superheroes will always be this incredible return on investment. The the other news story that I saw this week that I wanted to mention to you, and I don't know if you you read that site, Puck, which is like those, it's like a subscription site uh, that Matt Baloney does. Oh, I saw that he was writing. That. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, that. and uh, so there, he did a piece this week about Kathleen Kennedy's uh, contract extension, mm-hmm. and uh, but he kind of laid out all of the movies and the issues that they have gone through. Lord Miller getting fired off of Solo, Tony Gilroy redoing Rogue One, the investment in Ryan Johnson, and then the overcorrection back to JJ Benioff and Weiss signing up for a trilogy and walking away. Ryan Johnson's trilogy being in if not shelved or never happening. And this was all tied to the news that Patty Jenkins, who directed the two Wonder Woman movies, incredibly successful Wonder Woman movies for DC, her Rogue Squadron, her fighter pilot Star Wars movie, is indefinitely on hold. You know, and and I reading reading Baloney, it was like, it's not gonna happen, man. You know, like this yeah. this movie's not happening. And that even though they said it was for scheduling reasons, which but based on what I said about Tom Holland and Benedict Cumberbatch is not out of the question that it was creative differences that the, you, you just cannot please everybody over there and that it's just too hard. And that it's one thing for Filoni and Favreau to do man Mandalorian and that kind of TV universe that they're doing. And they have very set, like I think creative goals and creative executions there. And we'll see what happens when there's five star Wars shows on, you know, yeah. but that these movies, uh, just and and we're looking at basically there's going to be at least a five year span where there is no Star Wars movies, which is fucking crazy to think about when you go back to Bob Iger being like, I want a Star Wars movie in theaters every year, and it's fucking crazy to think about how much they had invested in uh, Daisy Ridley and Boyega 
being the next generation of Star Wars. It, it's sort of weird to think Tom Holland's going to be in like 15 more Spider-Man movies and we'll never see Daisy Ridley's Ray again. Yeah. I mean, I was the takeaway from that piece that, um, was it surprised that Kathy Kennedy has retained her job or explaining it, why? I think it, it noted that she is one of the most successful producers of all time and is obviously has like incredible wherewithal and, and competency, but was just like, objectively, these movies have all had troubled productions. And the reason why I brought it up is not to go off on a Star Wars jag, but more to say modern, especially IP blockbuster franchise filmmaking is such a house of cards, you know, and that you can think here we are. Ryan Johnson just made this movie. Obviously, there was a backlash to it, but I think you could call that like for me, that was the high point of the new the new Star Wars movies, with the exception of Rogue One. Um, and you, if you if you told me going into the day I saw that movie that there will be one more Star Wars movie, and then they're just like gonna not know how to make these things anymore, it would be pretty it would be pretty surprising. And the reason why I'm bringing this up mm-hmm. is because when you hear about them and they've got this giant blockbuster Spider-Man movie. To say nothing of the fact that Doctor Strange is an increasingly important part of everything that the MCU is yeah, doing. Yeah, and this is a real heat check for Cumberbatch. I'm not I'm not sure. And I'm they're fucking sure. they're fucking holding it together with scotch tape, man. Now, COVID did a lot of stuff to this with the release dates and production halts and everything. I just wonder whether or not that's sustainable long term. Can you keep these plates spinning? Cuz you can't just fuck one movie up. Cuz if you fuck one movie up, it might fuck up 10 years of planning. This is a really weird moment. And I think, I think the first thing to say is the falterings of the DC universe, the growing pains of the Spider-Man Sony universe, and certainly what's going on in Star Wars, what all of that does is point out how absolutely unprecedented and insane Marvel's 10-year run was. It just, you can't, you can't reproduce it. It was un, absolutely unreal, and they pulled it off. Now, if for, if those were if people who were on the inside of the, of those ten years would probably say if they only knew how held together with spit tape and spackle sure. and glue this was, but that doesn't matter long term or you know because it they pulled it off uh, and it worked. What we're seeing right now, and I think it's been exacerbated by COVID, but I think we would have been seeing it anyway, is a very very large scale hedging of bets. You know, um, it's you could look at Feige's behavior and professional um you know offerings over the last couple of years and be like oh well he this is what makes him a great coach right because he's completely changing his style without you totally realizing it instead right. of giant building blocks that stack on top of each other and always seem to fit he's shift downshifted to almost you know he's he's bought the the suitcase with a thousand legos in it mm-hmm. and just just playing mix and match honestly and it's sort of maybe to their benefit that they don't have, because what Star Wars did was like, we're just, everything matters. We're Star Wars. We are absolutely holy and sacred and everything is going to be delivered like a tablet from on high. And then people, some people didn't like the Ryan Johnson movie and they freaked TF out. Mm -hmm. And so the giant, giant face saving swings that they made suddenly aren't working. Like, Everyone loves Game of Thrones. These guys will make the next movies. Oh, they don't like Game of Thrones anymore. Oh, these aren't the movies you want. To... Total crisis of confidence, right? What is Feige doing right now? Well, Shang Chi was a success. Eternals was I, I liked it, sort of, on this <laughs> podcast. Um, but it's making money. And then, wait, what is he putting? What basket is he putting all of his eggs in? Not Spider Man. That's Sony's problem. It's you know, is it Wyatt Russell and Julia Louis Dreyfus? Yes. I mean- if you if you look sort at the, the trades, I mean, he's putting his eggs in the Star Wars basket. He's making a Star Wars movie, <laughs> and he's making a Star Wars movie. So yeah. is he taking his eye off the ball? So we are we are in a sort of strange moment, and it'll be interesting to say. Okay, I do want to say one, a couple more specific things about the the Spider Man movie. Yeah, but sure. This one could be great, but it also could. And and, it, and, it, and this doesn't mean it's not going to be great. It could be great. It could be bad as a movie. But it does seem inevitable that it is in some way going to be emblematic of how these things got too big uh, to always succeed. Mm-hmm. You know, like it is such a collision and collection of just wild ass swings and ideas and money and 
it's it's almost it's incredible. It, I mean, it is sort of inconceivable to look at this now. Um, you have some notes otherwise, excited? though. Yeah, am I excited to see some of these people? I mean, look, if the core of the movie is Holland and Zendaya like doing what they do, like I'm into that. When you said, "Am I excited to see Alfred Molina Cook, Chris?" I am like Disney animation head Jennifer Lee when she shuffles down the stairs in her bathrobe in the morning. Yeah, I'm excited to see Alfred Molina there cooking. <laughs> They're married. Does that, do I need to explain the joke? Did you have that pre-written? No. Wow. See? You said it a while ago. I was just sitting on it. Come on. <laughs> um, That's amazing. It's, he, he does a wonderful fry up, you know? Uh, Full English, I, yeah. I, 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 I love Alfred Molina. And Willem Dafoe. I mean, these are Oscar winner Jamie Foxx. I mean, these are great actors playing these parts. So that adds some heft and gravitas and, and fun to it. And I, I guess the thing that I like about it is the stakes of the movie, Then I think this is probably what Tom Holland is speaking to, it runs a little bit deeper than the villain of the week, right? Because what, what Melina seems to be implying in the trailer is that this is, this is existential, like he will cease to be. Mm -hmm. across multiple timelines and so it's hard to get bigger stakes than that seems it it does seem like it will be surprising in a number of directions and i think that is that is actually kind of high praise these days i just i the watching andrew garfield have to go through the tick tick boom promo tour and basically exclusively have to answer the question of are you in spider-man or not is it kind of breaks my heart a little bit for sure and also just like Charlie Cox, they're like, oh, Daredevil's going to be in this, and but to okay, he's a good actor, yeah. seems fine. The 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 big what if coming from this right is that we've seen five members. It, it, wait, is that Hayden Church as Sandman again? Is that I, I the takeaway? So. Yeah, I don't know. Why, why is no actually... one saying his name? Why is no one speaking his? Is this sideways slander? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, is he not famous enough to say that he's in this movie? Or is, it, or is there another Sandman in a different continuity that I'm not aware of? I, I have no idea. Honestly, you would know better than I do. Well, there's five of them, and then I guess is the sixth going to be Tom Hardy's Venom? I assume. I assume uh, it's not Jake Gyllenhaal's Mysterio because Jake Gyllenhaal has taken to wearing that fishbowl globe around his head full time on the streets of New York since <laughs> Taylor's new version of Red dropped. Um, it's fun. It's fun to have this stuff to talk about. Are you bemoaning the loss of the Patty Jenkins movie? I feel like you had a you had a funny of, reaction of Rogue that. Squadron. Uh. No, I was just like, I couldn't believe that that was the movie that they were like, let's rent an F-16 <laughs> and have Patty Jenkins. It's like, what, what did, how much did they have to cut a check to, you know, Raytheon or whoever to, to get Patty Jenkins next to an F-16 to be like, Rogue Squadron is coming. The first feature directed by a woman. It's like, and then they were just like, oh yeah, we can't make this movie for whatever reason. It. Yeah. Did did you did you have any thoughts about the other Disney stuff since we're just we're we're on Franchise Island right now? Did, uh, any of the stuff from last week? You know, it was it was really interesting because like those a lot of those little teasers were essentially like bootlegged because that was a very like it the event yep. exclusivity of it made <laughs> meant that Everyone I saw had Portuguese subtitles. Yeah. Shouts so to I, your Succession podcast the other week. I, I, I watched the She-Hulk one, which is like eight seconds. I, I think for She-Hulk and Moon Knight, I was like, this isn't really it, right? The She-Hulk one looked like a Proof of Life hostage video. <laughs> Maybe that was just the version I saw, but it did not. It did, I don't think that's what they... Okay, here's what I'll say. You know what it looked like? It looked like everything they scraped from the dailies on Tuesday of the first week. Right. Right. Which and it may the, well be. The Moon Knight one, I will say I that's probably the Marvel thing that I have been most excited about. Yeah. Maybe since like Iron Man 3. And I just really hope that that is not the accent that he does the entire movie, the entire show. It's a bold choice. <laughs> I mean, listen, and this is going to come up when we talk about Shrink Next Door, but Oscar Isaac is definitely in the He's he's he is our current recipient of the Alan Alda. Wait, he's not Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> and especially after Lewin Davis, especially after um, uh, scenes from a marriage, uh -huh. and you know Moon Knight, Jew, Jewish superhero. Oh, I didn't know that. With many voices in his head, I would assume most of them are his mother haranguing him. No, uh, he could have different personalities, and that may be that may be one of them. Yeah. 
they, that was the one that they chose to show. But yeah, I didn't really have any big takeaways from them. What about you? No, just that like, you know, I, th- I thought the Ms. Marvel one seemed to be fun and have the right tone. I do, as a comic book fan, and also as a fan of things not always being epic and city destroying and dark, like I do like that they have this this separate pipeline to play with mm-hmm. to do different stories. I guess the one thing that that occurred to me, and I think this has probably been the consuming thought at Marvel over the last few years as they've greenlit these shows is, well, if if it's no big deal to have Mark Ruffalo be the CGI Hulk for a TV show that he's not even the star of, like, what is that? What makes it a movie now? Sure. Yeah. And I think that's that that crisis zone is where Star Wars lives because the Favreau Filoni TV shows is just an injected into our veins nostalgia pipeline of everything that people who the people who they're always say they're trying to please, they're pleased. Yeah. They're very, 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 very pleased. And that's why they're making 20 shows. So then but, what are we doing the movies for? But they got like 19 into it and it was like, this is cool. This is wagon train. This is dope. Like he just goes off and does yeah. a thing and then it's and then they had to fucking they had to bring Luke in, man. And now it's like when you watch the Boba Fett trailer, you're like, cool. Like, so is like, are we going to get Jabba's son? Like, what's, what's, what is the big drop that comes on each one of these L- lower stakes show? Yeah. Little Jabba, baby Jabba. Um, hey, that was the same thing. It was like, I saw Feige had a quote this week about Hawkeye where he was like, I like Hawkeye because like Hawkeye is like a, a limited series set in a very limited amount of space where it's like the week before Christmas and will Hawkeye get home to his family for Christmas? And like the stakes are low. And now fool me once, like, of course, I'm sure like, what is Mephisto? Mephisto could come out, you know, like in Christmas, jumping out of the Rockefeller tree. But <laughs> Just as our last note on this, all this Disney content, I think I sent it to you, right? But did, did, I, did our listeners see, I hope you saw on YouTube, you can Google Sarah Paulson, Disney Plus. No, and I like see this. one of our great television actors, you know the 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 doyen of Ryan, Ryan Murphy projects, like so versatile, so great, so beloved. There's a there's a like an EPK of her sitting in a chair, being like, "This is how I imitate Baby Yoda," and here's all the great content that I love to watch <laughs> on Disney. And I and I've I watched it like nine times. Uh huh. And the only explanation I could come up with was that Bob Chapek had kidnapped Holland Taylor. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> Sarah Paulson's wife. And was just like, you can have her back when you do baby Yoda ears in front of this high def camera. I don't understand what the synergy was or in what context she agreed to do it. And is this going to be a thing now? Like, for example, if you do an FX TV show or like Disney yeah, cast well, like, members. Will they get like Jessica Lange to do like, here's my right, favorite exactly. part of Hawkeye. But it's like, are you on set? And like, okay, there's the DP, there's the COVID compliance officer, and there's a man in a goofy suit with a fucking camera. You're right? a fucking cat. You're a cast member now, dog. Uh, before we get into the two Wild. shows we wanted to talk about, I just wanted to mention, you know, Party Down. It was announced that Party Down is going to come back for a reunion yeah. season. Uh, they have almost all of the cast except Lizzie Kaplan, which is too bad because I think over the years, first it was a pipe dream that they would bring Party Down back because it was such like a cult classic it was basically unwatched when it was first on and then became this hugely beloved show as the years went God, by as people would rent it on dvd and then later it was streaming and i the beat was always like the sort of line on on the, any reunion was always only if everyone can do it and that's mm-hmm. always been the same thing with community and everything like it's like if, when you talk about bringing these people back together it's like yeah but we wouldn't want to do it unless we could get like the core group together I and think it's they would too do bad community without chevy i feel like i think would. so too yeah but like yeah. it but Don Glover obviously would be like a, uh-huh. a big get for them. So with the party down thing, it's too bad. But I, I gotta say, it's pretty crazy when you see the two things that Lizzie Kaplan is doing instead of party down are starring in Paramount Plus's Fatal Attraction reboot as Alex and then appearing in Fleischman is in trouble, right? Yes. Which FX is developing from the Taffy Brodus or Ackner novel. Um, yeah. A couple things. Party Down, one of my favorite comedy series of all time, for as, as much for the comedy as for the pathos and the romance that's in it. And Adam Scott and Lizzie Kaplan's performances on that show are just, I mean, they've done great work. They'll continue to, to do great work, but I may never love performances more from mm-hmm. the two of them. Um, and I love that couple. And this is, as you said, Chris, like John Enbaum, who created the show, 
and uh, executive produces along with his mentor, Rob Thomas, is back writing it. This is all like, this is not a cash grab. These are all the same people who are really doing it as labors of love to be a part of it. My question is, when did Lizzie Kaplan say she wasn't available? Because that matters a lot. My assumption when John sat down to write the show is that he was writing for all of them. Sure. At what point did they have to start changing things? What I'll say is there is a tiny part of me that, first of all, that loves Lizzie Kaplan as much as every other part of me. But there is a tiny part of me that wonders if this might not be secretly a good thing. So I was wondering the same thing, not because I did not want any one person particularly involved and not that there won't be a lot of like gymnastics to get ev- like mm-hmm. why everybody would be in the same situation again mm-hmm. anyway. And if they're still caterers, I don't know, but you know what I mean? But the thing is, is that this was a show essentially about how life doesn't always work out. Yes, and this if, is it. if you're kind of just saying like, oh, their lives didn't work out in so much as they're still doing the same thing. But, you know, this core romance, this will they or won't they that's at the center of the show, it is kind of true to the tone of the show if it just didn't happen for these guys. Exactly. And I think that that kind of opens up this to be more than just a everybody feels good reunion. Because if this one true pairing that the fans loved is settled business, then where does the drama and stakes come from in it? I mean, that, that's, that's befuddled a lot of other reunions because that was the, one of the main engines of story. And so it's kind of exciting in a weird way to think about the disappointment baked into her not being there and having that actually be lived experience for the characters and certainly Adam Scott's character. I'll also say, based on absolutely no insider knowledge whatsoever, I bet she could show up for an episode. I wouldn't be surprised. I will say also, just one more note, is that Rob Thomas, who is, like you said, the executive producer of this show, uh, has done this dance before where he brought back Veronica Mars. Now, they did a movie that was very much like a fan service, like, it was literally funded by fans, was, I believe. You yeah, know, and, and, it was Kickstarter. Yeah. But when they did the the new season, I think it was on Hulu, it was very challenging to certain things that longtime Veronica Mars fans held true about that show. And so this is somebody who's not afraid to, to literally kill his darlings. Um, so it would be interesting to see how they handle uh, Lizzie Kaplan's absence. Also, upheaval has always been a part of the show. Um, our old live Game of Thrones podcast pal, Andrea Savage, was the star yeah. of the show yeah. in the original incarnation back when first when Paul Rudd was going to star in it and then when Adam Scott took over. She dropped out because I believe she was um, she was pregnant at the time they were filming. And that, that makes it sound like she was fired. She was not. She stepped away at that moment and then ended up guest starring in a first season episode that opened the door for Lizzie Kaplan. And similarly, Jane Lynch had scheduling issues and left the show after the first season, was replaced wonderfully in a different role, of course, by Megan Mullally. Both Lynch and Mullally are signed on to be a part of this. So it's baked in. I think I, I'm, I'm no less optimistic. Let's talk about the shows we want to talk about here. We'll take a quick Let's break. Let's talk about the shows you want to talk about. We'll, we'll yeah. take a quick break and we'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Why does this room look amazing? What'd you change? I just got these custom shades from blinds.com. It's all online, so it's really easy. I remember shopping for blinds. I waited around all day just to get a quote. It took forever. And the worst part, hidden fees. How about you? I chatted with my Blinds.com design consultant on my time. Plus, they make it easy to DIY or add installation like I did. Blinds.com sounds way better. Way better. Shop Blinds.com for up to 45% off. Rules and restrictions may apply. Okay, as my uh, birthday gift... Andy agreed to watch Mayor of Kingstown, the new Taylor Sheridan show on Paramount. It's on Paramount Plus. They're airing the first few episodes will air after Yellowstone on Paramount Network. 
And then I think they are pulling it uh, off linear television and putting it just on the app. Uh, so two episodes are available now. I don't know if they aired both, but two episodes are available now. Right. Um, which I have seen both. I think, Andy, you saw one. I For did. people who don't know, it stars Jeremy Renner, Kyle Chandler, and Diane Wiest. They are members of the McCluskey family who are kind of a very important, powerful family within the underworld of this small town in Michigan, Kingstown, where there is essentially the only business, functional business there is incarceration. It's it's home to several prisons. And uh, what Mitch and Mike McCluskey, Kyle Chandler and Jeremy Renner's characters do is they are operate as like Michael Clayton's to keep everything running inside and outside of the prison. So criminals and guards inside, and then also like the criminal and uh, law enforcement element outside of the prison. These guys essentially facilitate uh, work payoffs, work favors, work uh, maneuvering of chess pieces so that everything stays the same, but everything stays relatively quote unquote peaceful, which is not peaceful right. because there's lots of violence. Obviously, this is a Taylor Sheridan show. Uh, Taylor Sheridan is just really, his wings are just fully extended right now. So he's got Yellowstone currently in its fourth season. Mayor of Kingstown just came on. And in the first episode, the first two episodes of this season of Yellowstone, he threw in two backdoor pilot scenes, one for 1883, which is the Yellowstone prequel set in the Old West, and one for Four Sixes, which is going to be a show about a ranch in Texas. He's also got an oil rig show called Landman coming at some point uh, in the near future. And uh, I think, Andy, this is the first real cannonball you did into the, to the Sheridan verse, right? Unfortunately, yeah. Outside and, of Sicario and, I, and like, I don't know if you saw Hell or High Water and One River, but like that stuff. Yeah, right? I, I am a fan of his film work, film writing. Okay. Um, I did not see Wind River, and, but he, uh, and I, and I have, and I genuinely have interest in watching Yellowstone both from a industry standpoint, but also, you know, it is a four quadrant show. Mm -hmm. Like there are people who unabashedly love it. And then there's a whole bunch of people who abashedly love it. You know, there are people who are like, I don't, it's not really for me, but I, you know, it, it, that's kind of amazing to have a show connect with so many people across so many different divides of age and class or interest level, whatever. That's cool. And I am into it and I would like to check it out. So I w- want to just say a couple of things up top. One is that I think the reason why Yellowstone is the four quadrant show that you're discussing that you mentioned is you can either go for the set pieces, the thriller aspect, the crime show aspect of it, but you can actually just kick back and vibe out on horses and mountains. Like it is mm-hmm. a beautifully made show. It's shot mm-hmm. on uh, a ranch. I believe Taylor Sheridan has up there and it is gorgeous to look at. It's also expertly made TV, which is funny because Taylor Sheridan has always maintained, like, I don't know how to write TV. This is a 70-hour movie. That's fucking bullshit. It is really, really, really well-done television, both in terms of it's episodically paced really well, and when something isn't working, you just stop hearing about a plot line, like Jamie's baby. You're just like, okay, I guess this guy doesn't have a baby anymore. And he's, he's pretty accomplished at that whether or not he knows how to write it he's appeared on lots of tv shows and i think he knows how to make it um i will say that i really liked mayor of kingstown as you everybody knew i would but i openly realized that i think the reason why it's getting relatively poor reviews is it does not have that extra level of Mm -hmm. like i can escape from the morbidity of the show because yellowstone's pretty morbid too and just watch the country music and the cowboys and the mountains and the rivers. This is a slate gray urban Michigan show where nothing, there's no hope and there's no sunshine and it's raining. Even when there is sun, there's a scene where Jeremy Renner is at a a funeral and it's sunny and it's fucking pouring. And that is like the show it is. It's never not raining. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, we can get into the details of the show, and I will just say uh, it's almost impossible to talk about this show without a spoiler. So if you haven't watched it and you yes. want to watch it, maybe skip ahead to our Shrink Next Door conversation, which is coming uh, in just a bit. So from now the on... Time, the timestamps are always visible, right? On this podcast somewhere? like on iTunes I think that's, or... a produ- that's a question for our producer, Andy. Yes, I put them in the description. So I will Thanks, clearly... Kaya. 
know in the description where timestamps are. So this I, is I I knew that she would come through on that. Going forward, this is a spoiler conversation about Mayor of Kingstown, Andy. Yeah, the floor is yours, my co-mayor. I mean, that was my first question. <laughs> I, I, I okay. If we're going to start with the spoilers, are there two I'll mayors or what? I'm a little disappointed in myself because I had two major questions in the first 15 minutes of watching this show. One, I'm sorry, who's the mayor? Is this is this is this <laughs> the like the mayor I was has so far not appeared on this show? Yeah. But is this also like how I was co-president of the student council because there were only two people running and we both wanted to win? Uh, Classic Quaker. Question, Quaker the second question I had exactly. The second question I had was. Why is Kyle Chandler on this program? Right. Luckily, while watching the episode, I answered my own question <laughs> before the show answered it for me. Yeah. Uh, so my main takeaway is respect to our golden small screen God for getting a juicy COVID check last year. God bless you, Kyle Chandler. Right. So the inciting incident of Mayor of Kingstown is that Kyle Chandler's character, which they've done a very good... Not the mayor. (laughs) They've done a very good job advertising this as Jeremy Renner and Kyle Chandler's show. Kyle Chandler's character is executed in his own office about three quarters of the way into the pilot. People love stunt casting like that. And you'd think that we'd be onto it, but I barely was. I, Um, I, I was too. Although there are some I, I, real McBain moments with Kyle Chandler's character. There's one of the McBainiest moments in the history of non-parody television where he's talking to those guys and he's just like, I'm always going to be in your life. What does he say? <laughs> it's like, it's so, I have plans today, tomorrow, and next Wednesday. Like, there's nothing that anyone could do to me. My boat's called Live Forever. <laughs> it's wild. Um, you know, I'm always trying to, especially when I'm doing something out of my love for you. Like mm. I want to find the positive. And sure. I, and I have to say that, um, well, I personally would not last five minutes in Kingstown real or fictional. Chris, I, I, I mean this really sincerely. I think you would really be good as the guy who's like, you don't, you don't need to see that. Mike, 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 look me in the eyes. Mike, oh, they, you don't need to go in there. You, you don't know, need to see that. Mike, you know who that is. That's Hugh Dillon who co-created the show co-created with Taylor Sheridan. Show. And yeah. now plays the sheriff on Yellowstone and a cop on Kingstown. Never let it be said that Sheridan doesn't take care of his friends. No. Um, like a real mayor of Kingstown. But you know what I mean? Like the dude who's just like, come here, come here, walk away from there. You do that. I feel yeah. like you'd be really good at that. That would be good. Um, you don't need to see this, Mike. I, I looked at it for a while. I could describe it to you, Mike. <laughs> it's a lot of blood. Not Mike, like the movies, I, Mike, Mike, what if I draw? I'll do like an anime kind of thing. <laughs> MS Paint, Mike. Um, I, I was really, really, really confounded by this show. Okay. What what really confounded me was it was such a unique, and I have to say not necessarily to my taste, uh, combination where the pacing, structure, and storytelling depth was like a CBS procedural, which mm-hmm. can be pejorative. I don't even mean it to be pejorative. What I mean is that it actually felt quite digestible. Let's put it that way. It's digestible. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, okay, there are these guys, here's some good guys, here's some bad guys. It's a lot of gray area. Okay. We see where the drama is going to come from and it's good run for a hundred seasons, but I've never really seen that level of digestible structure mixed with this type of dense bran health nut loaf storytelling. Yeah. Like, it was like the wire dressed for Halloween as the closer. No, what was the 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 mentalist? The mentalist, yeah. Because broad strokes, I don't think I could have done as eloquent a job as you in describing the show, but I could describe what was going on in the show and who the characters were. Beyond that, I didn't understand a single fucking thing that happened. Yeah, I didn't the, understand what they were talking about. The two major I didn't plot understand points the context. are literally things that people mutter to one another in a diner and in a bar where you're like, Oh, okay. Like I kind of caught that. And, uh, I didn't have subtitles on. So like I missed basically like one plot point is a guard at the prison has been hooked yep. by the Crips gang that right. they have essentially gotten their hooks into him and are like now blackmailing him to help them on the inside and the outside. 
The other is a rather elaborate, I think, Estonian mafia situation Mm. where there's like a buried bag of money and a guy who's in prison, but his gang that's outside of prison. I mean, it is is very densely plotted for something that feels very fleet footed. Another example of what you're talking about, Andy, is the incredibly long monologues that Diane Wiest has about institutional racism. (laughs) Yes. Not just, she has two types of monologues in the show. Institutional racism and telling her sons who they are and what they mean. (laughs) That's right. The scene where she talks to Jeremy Renner and she's like, here are the things that your brother was. And she lists them. Yeah. And she's like, she she is literally a Academy Award winning Excel document in this scene. And she's like, now let me switch tabs and tell you what you are. So the audience knows as well. The Diane Weist of it all bummed me out a little bit, I got to say. Because, you know, my motto is, and you, you know, say it with me, listeners, Weist always rises. You know what I mean? Like, she, she is, she's as good as it gets. I love her. Loved her in the Soderbergh movie last year. And there's a moment in this when we see her give a long speech about, about racism in America. And then a, 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 some, a, she's teaching at the prison. And so one of the, the, the women inmates comes up and approaches her. And I'm like, okay, so now we're going to get like a little, that classic, you know, uh, Weast meets West banter. Absolutely. You know, and she's going to, she's, she's, she's a delightful, bubbly performer who has gravitas. That's what makes her so great. And she instead dead eyes this young woman (laughs) and goes, get the fuck out of my face. (laughs) I was like, and I don't want to tell Sheridan is so much more successful than I could ever dream of being on every level. And he certainly earned it. I am not here to tell him how to do his job. I know. But it was, it was a little, it was a little weird. Right. It was a little weird. It, it was like casting Jason Alexander in a Joe Pesci role. Like I, you got Jason, you got, you got Costanza right here. You know, like, what are we doing? That stuff tripped me up. So, I know that there's nothing that anyone hates more than being like, just give it a chance. But I did watch the second episode. I'm going to keep watching the show. I, I really like parts of it. Uh, Renner, in the second es- episode especially, I, I don't know when they shot the pilot versus the second episode, but he looks different. I'll put it that mm-hmm. way. And you remember why he was such a a hot guy coming out of Hurt Locker when you see the second episode. I- his His like kind of gravity that he has and the way he handles these scenes and the way he's kind of living in this character are pretty, pretty impressive in the second episode. I can, I, I can well imagine that. And I don't want to write, write it off entirely. Um, the other thing that was sort of consuming me in watching the pilot though, was the psychology of why this got made to a degree and, 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 you know, why it got made because Taylor Sheridan got handed literally got handed the bag of Estonian money mm-hmm. by by Paramount and be like, make everything for us, whatever yeah. you want. Any idea you've had, we'll make it. Green light, green light, go. Um, but the renter of it all, I mean, we used to talk about him quite a bit in very high spirits. I think some of the stories about him and other aspects of his life have, have dampened yes. our personal enthusiasm for talking about him as a comic character in the world. But obviously we admire his acting ability and his talent. But we often would talk about how he was so constantly being groomed, if not misgroomed, to take over franchises. There's the infamous Mission Impossible where he was going to be the new face of it. And Tom Cruise was like, no one does that to me. I will climb the Burj Khalifa in flip-flops. Yeah. And that was And you that. will watch me. Yeah, you will you watch, watch me do it. Every step of the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. You'll be on the ground being like, how can that man do that? It's so, um, it's so tough. Like, Renner literally is just like, that Ethan, he's just unkillable <laughs> the best there is in what he does and only he can do it you and i anyone who listens to the podcast know adore the born legacy mm-hmm. but audiences did not feel the same way and that did not move forward so there was something kind of poetic if not too on the nose about a show in which he is the hot-headed younger brother of the star and kyle chandler is a star and he's a tv star with that charisma and then the show being about that guy indisputably being taken out there yeah. is no, yeah. no mission impossible no five stan- no stannis baratheon going on with this guy <laughs> so that was kind of interesting to me but yet again though and I'm, I'm just happy to hear you say that about the second episode because for whatever else you can say about renner 
I just continue to think that he's at his best when he's a character actor. And yet between this and Hawkeye and, you know, whatever the movies he takes, he he wants to be a leading man or people want him to be a leading man. And he's never, that's not his strength in my outsider's opinion. Yeah, so I I think I'll continue to check in on this if there's if there's a massive uptick or some Andy Andy adjacent stuff. Uh, Aiden Gillen shows up in the second episode as as what will be I imagine the heavy for the season. So I'm pretty into it. Let's talk about Shrink Next Door. Yeah, fascinating uh, to me. Yeah, can you break this one down? Yeah, so I, I think pe- a, a lot more people, not me, but we're familiar with the story because it was written about heavily, but also was the subject of. Um, a popular wondery podcast called the shrink next door about a true story uh that began in the late 70s early 80s when a um new york businessman basically began seeing a therapist and that relationship became very unprofessional in a lot of surprising um ways where basically after two decades the psychiatrist was living you know had taken over the other man's life and business and was controlling it at an almost Bengali like level. I, if I sound vague, it's because I have not read the articles or read ahead because I wanted to watch the series on its own merits once, um, once it got started. So this is a vision of TV's not necessarily future, but it's present where a podcast studio like Wondery is very much in Hollywood saying, here are our goods. What do you want to do with them? And, you know, there's a Tiger King series coming, many, many other adaptations of podcasts. Um, Slow Burn, first season is becoming uh, Gaslit mm-hmm. by our buddy Sam Esmail's company, et cetera, et cetera. So this was packaged, put together, and undeniable package. Will Ferrell and Paul Rudd want to work together again. Um, first time since Anchorman, potentially. I'm not sure. Um, sounds right. You know, there was a bake-off, who's going to write it, what the take is. Georgia Pritchett, a really talented British writer who was on Succession, uh, gets the gig. Michael Showalter, who will always be Michael Showalter from the state mm-hmm. to, to to people of our generation, but is having a really remarkably great career resurgence, if not just surgence, at this you know at this moment. He directed The Big Sick. He's direct, he directed Eyes of Tammy Faye. He directed the series, and it arrived on Apple TV. Who won the bidding war for it? With uh, last week, three mm-hmm. episodes up. I've watched two reviews. Unkind to downright scathing. And this is one of those programs where I, I, I honestly can't tell you what I would have written if I was still a TV critic, yeah. and I'm glad I'm not. Did what you get the impression you, that a lot of those reviews were based on more than just the three episodes, or did you think it was more of like a, a first impression? I, I didn't read too deeply, um, but I think that they had been given screeners past three episodes. Um, I don't know how many they watched. I, I found this show really interesting. In a lot of ways, I really enjoyed watching the first two episodes, and I found it very compelling. And that's not all entirely positive. It's it's not entirely negative. Let's start with recognizing something that I think is tough to swallow for a lot of people, critics. TV is a playground now for big stars to be like, I'm I want to do clear, something I'm, else. Yeah, clear out a little bit. Yeah, clear out. I we're, we're, I'm, I'm going to do ISO on this one. Uh, or do it with a buddy. That put a lot of people in a bind. Apple bought a Will Ferrell, Paul Rudd show. And this is not what I think they necessarily thought they were buying. And it's certainly not what I think they thought they'd be selling. Because both of them are two of the funniest performers alive, Will Ferrell especially. And they are both very funny at times in the show from what I've seen. But this is not a funny ha-ha show. I would, I would, I would say I did not laugh once during the first two episodes. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. It is a psychologically unsettling show with a lot of broad choices and a tonal high wire act basically to pull off Mm -hmm. where Paul Rudd, I think is just much more at ease than Farrell playing his part. Paul Rudd is Ike Hirschberg, the, the uh, psychologist, and he, you know, he he settles into what I, what I imagine in real life was a broadly charismatic, totally bizarre character. Mm-hmm. Farrell, it's a tougher one, right? Because he is sort of this arrested man child. He, he talks the, the the biggest stretch in the in the whole show is Will Farrell's character in the first episode or second being like, I'm turning 40. I'm like, well <laughs> like some turns have already turned. But 
as this sort of like arrested man child who who's been who's taken over his family's fabric business but is still just very uh, just arrested in, in in many ways that's a richer place to play but a more challenging one i think yeah. uh, for an actor and i think will farrell to his credit he doesn't do the the famous comedian school of dramatic acting which i think jonah hill subscribes to which is if it's drama i won't give you anything sure but if i'm in There's, if i'm in don't look up watch the fuck out <laughs> yeah exactly because <laughs> i'm gonna burn your eyebrows off of how good i am yeah i kind of liked it and i and i i couldn't fully tell you why but there was something interesting at the margins about neediness in adulthood and emotional damage that was compelling to me. And I thought that there were the contours of something kind of interesting, kind of unexpected. And underlying all of it, not only are you watching a lot of money being spent on a lot of good actors and great production value, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, like period piece New York City, you know. Shot in downtown Los Angeles. I could tell looks, that that, yeah. I could tell. Bravo, by the way. For real though, like that was awesome. DTLA, one of its best performances ever. The only giveaway, because I'm a total dork who stares at the stuff, was there's they they probably CGI'd a bunch of stuff, like signs or trees or whatever, but they didn't spend the money to digitally erase a sign that says Carnitas. <laughs> and let me tell you something. In 1982, <laughs> Manhattan. Yeah. That was not a word that had ever has ever been said. I was just talking uh, about this with saying. Joanna, but there's a point also where uh Catherine Hahn's character on this show says, mm -hmm. I can't even, which I don't think people were saying before 2015 or 16, if, if not even more recently. There's one other one like that, too, that I caught, too, a little yeah. anachronism, but that that it's fine. And you always wonder, though, like, is that a scripted error or was that the actor just improvising a little bit and the emotions sure. worked, whatever. Um, what was your take on the show? You know, I got to say, so I, I don't know if I can fully articulate this. The, sh the thing that this show reminded me a lot of is The Cable Guy, which is another, mm. uh, another... It's a cringe classic. Yeah, and that one is a little bit more comic, obviously, and you know, but it was a real also pivot from two giant comedic movie stars, Ben Stiller and Jim Carrey, away from you know the, the sort of meat and potatoes that they had been known for. And it was a movie that's about manipulation, and it's about codependency, and it's about you know, it's it's about these things that I think in different contexts I'm interested in. So, for instance, love a con man movie. You know, I'm, I'm very interested in 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 those kinds of, of films. For some reason, this story, which is essentially about the long game mm -hmm. of a therapist to dig his, you know, to to manipulate his patient for his own financial benefit, and I know it's more complicated than that, but that is essentially the log line. I just, I just kind of like felt my skin crawl while I was watching it. I just don't like stories like this for some reason, and I, I don't, I don't know what it is about me that doesn't find this to be compelling drama. My wife felt the same way. She was uncomfortable watching it and didn't want to watch it. I didn't have that reaction at all. There was something I think this is one of those ones where I've only watched two, and I'm very curious to see how it plays out because there's, I have hopes for it, which mm -hmm. is always a dangerous place to be, because especially two episodes in, you're not really sure where you're headed and what their goal was sure. in the story they wanted to tell. But for me, this is just like, a, it is a foundationally Jewish story in a way that, and I want to say that not because, and I saw this in some of the reviews, like there's a little bit of like, Mrs. Maisel baiting, right? Because of the credited cast, only Paul Rudd is Jewish. Mm -hmm. Will Ferrell has a beautiful singing voice for Hebrew. He looks great on the Bema. Catherine Hahn, I'm, I'm going to allow it. Sorry, sure. Sarah Silverman, you know, <laughs> okay. who, who took issue with her Joan Rivers casting. But like, Catherine Hahn is so great in this. She's just such a great actor. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. I'm fine with it. Um, Casey Wilson, uh, uh, you know, married to a Jew in real life, fine. I allow it. Yeah. Now, this is not up to me to decide, but there is something kind of interesting. There is an interesting argument to be had. We're not going to have the argument. I don't actually have the equipment to have it, but there's something like deeply assimilationist in an interesting way that a Jewish story could also be kind of a New York story or a therapy story. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of, that's just what it is. And people recognize that. No, but what was interesting to me about it is the, the echoes of the, the specific generational piece of it where Will Ferrell's character and Paul Rudd's character, who are, I guess, roughly the same age when they meet in the early 80s and then on through it. There's a reference to, like, I think, Rudd's character's parents being Holocaust survivors. And 
um, we get glimpses early on of Will Ferrell's family and the business and all mm -hmm. this stuff. And there's something that is compelling to me about that generation whose parents came to this country literally with nothing, fleeing extinction, not necessarily having the mindset or tools to teach their children how to be adults in a world because the yeah. world was absolutely a temporary dangerous place. And so what we see in Farrell's character and Rudd's character, like these broken shells and the small bits of like pieces that they've super glued to themselves to exist and then how they interact with each other. That's really interesting to me. And there's something like very just 20th century jewelry about that to me that I'm interested in. I don't know if that's the show. I yeah. don't know if that's the show they sold. I don't know if that's the show that Will Farrell. I don't know if he connects to that. I don't know if that matters, but these are the questions that I'm asking after watching it. And unlike in other shows, like, like the question I was asking after mayor of Kingstown was, I'm sorry, what? The question I was asking after <laughs> You're like, this, who's, who's the mayor? <laughs> I, 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 but who did I vote for in the recent civic election? No, in this one, I'm like, those are big questions. And I actually want to keep watching to see if they're answered. Not in a, Ooh, I'm going to catch them if they don't. I'm going to give them heck. No, I'm just, I, that's big stuff they're playing it's with. It's funny too. In a relatively I would, entertaining way. So I would just we'll mention, see. you know, I think that the, uh, the outside perspective on Apple as a network, to, so to speak, is that it's uh, aspirational stuff like Ted Lasso or, you know, maybe if, even if Morning Show isn't aspirational, like you want to act like these people, it's yeah. you wouldn't mind having their apartments, you know, all that. Right. But the flip of that is stuff like Shrink Next Door and Physical, where yeah. they, they seem pretty unafraid to make shows about pretty fucked up people and have those people be the audience POV. And it's not like, oh, I get like this sort of step of remove with somebody's, you know, who's normal, quote unquote, dealing with this person, the Rose Byrne character or the Will Ferrell and Paul Rudd characters. You're kind of trapped with these people. And I, I got to admit, I had to hit eject on physical at a certain point, which even you I and I had too. said. You we and really I had liked it. Yeah. And I made it to like episode nine and I never went back to it. It's really, it's a really interesting question about Apple. And I don't know what to chalk it up to because you could say, oh, well, this is the best case scenario for the Hollywood artistic community because the newest player who has a lot of money is going to empower storytellers to, to, to tell whatever story they want and they're not, not be worried about the guardrails or whatever. That doesn't necessarily jibe with what I've heard about some of the ways Apple does business. You know, and it also doesn't necessarily, that, that's not really reflected in Invasion or Foundation or the three Tom Hanks movies that they have this month or whatever. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So I guess my question is, are physical and shrink next door representative of the type of storytelling choices that Apple's going to allow people to do because they're Apple and they can do it? Or is it really just showing us that when these shows were packaged and sold two plus years ago, and Apple was the newest kid on the block, they, like AMC, you know, almost 20 years ago, 15 years ago, were the ones who would do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now that might no longer be the case. So what we're seeing is more of an after shock as opposed to a path forward. Let's wrap it up there. Uh, we have succession on Sunday night, Monday morning, whatever. I think Andy and I are going to take next Thursday off since it's Thanksgiving. So we probably won't do anything uh, for that, that episode. And then we'll be back again with succession. So a little bit of a break in between. But when we come back, man, th there's a lot of TV right now. We have uh, Wheel of Time and... There's Yellow Jackets, and there's just like a ton of stuff coming. The Great is coming back. Station Eleven. Station Eleven is coming. So just, it's coming Hawkeye. hot and heavy. Yeah, and we have Hawkeye. We'll definitely be talking about, and then we have to get into year end stuff. So very busy time on the watch. Hope everybody uh, is uh, doing well. Enjoy Succession on Sunday, and then we'll talk to you the following week. Thanks to producer Kaya. Happy birthday, Chris! Thank the best you. Best who ever did it. <laughs>